good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome once again to another edition of Crossroads. Uh, uh, we've got uh, my brothers Yaku again with with us. Uh, hey, Yaku, how are you doing? Hey, good evening, Matt. Too good in you. Yeah, good. Uh, it's quite a cold and uh, uh, wet evening. Lots of rain in the Cape over the next few days. And uh, yeah, also with us is uh, brother Colin. Hey, Colin. How you doing? Hey, how's it, Frank? Yeah. So, yeah, just uh, welcome everyone again. And, um, yeah, it's good to, to be together once again. Uh, we're going to be discussing, um, again, maybe somewhat of a controversial topic, but um, I think it's a topic really well, worth uh, discussing. Um, and I also would really encourage you tonight, if you have any questions, um, to, to please uh, send those through. It'll, we'd love to, to get to them tonight. Uh, we're going to try and go in a bit longer tonight, uh, perhaps about an hour, just so we can get through uh, everything. And, and so the topic tonight is uh, on Calvinism and evangelism. Uh, and you can see in the, the slide that we had put up initially, it's really around the, the fact that, all, all, you know, when we consider Calvinism, we, when we consider evangelism, um, would we say these are friends or foes? Um, are they compatible? And so uh, just really to kick off, guys, um, before we actually look at the subjects of evangelism in regards to Calvinism or Reformed theology, uh, I just want to maybe discuss, um, you know, what does it mean when we say, you know, Calvinism or, or when, when we say that God saves monogistically uh, and compared to, uh, you know, probably the, I'd probably say the most commonly held view in most evangelical circles uh, that God saves synergistically. So yeah, maybe if you guys can just, we can kick off with that and maybe you know, from there we uh, can discuss a few other points around uh, the subject. Oh, sure, Matt. Um, you know, so there, there's what seems like nowadays a, a very like big discussion, which is like you said, does God save monogistically, which mono does god save alone or is it synergistic is god and man working together and, and like you pointed out um today it's a very popular view that god saves synergistically but if we looked at church history what we'd actually see is that that most of the saints of old um, or the majority of strong saints of old those who we would consider heroes they held to the view that god saves monogistically and um, the very simple reason as to why they did this is because the Bible also holds to the view that God saves monogistically, that, that it is God and God alone who saves. Um, we, we see this, you know, throughout the Old Testament. You know, I'd, I'd encourage anybody who questions this, you know, a good exercise to do is read the book of Genesis. Then go look at the book of Genesis and all these, these chosen people that God works with through time and see who of them chose God and who of them God chose. And, and what you'll see is, is in almost every single case, it is God who acts. Um, you know, in Exodus, God very famously in an often quoted verse says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will show compassion on whom I have compassion. Uh, God clearly stating that it is he who decides who he'll have mercy on and who he'll have compassion with. Um, you know, if we look at the New Testament, John chapter 6, uh, I think is a great place to look uh, where Jesus actually speaks, you know, and they talk, you know, his disciples ask him, why are you teaching these hard sayings? You know, and Jesus's response is, um, no one can come to me unless the Father in heaven um, enables him or draws him. Uh, you know, and then John 3, where we get that very famous passage, John 3.16, you, you know, before that happens, when Jesus is busy talking to Nicodemus, um, you know, Nicodemus asks about the kingdom of heaven, and, and Jesus' response is that, um, that no one can see the, the kingdom of heaven unless, you know, he has been born again, unless God has done a work in him. You know, and so I would say unequivocally, the Bible teaches that, um, that God saves monogistically, that salvation belongs to God and God alone. It is by his grace and his grace completely that we are saved. 
Yeah, Matt, um, to link up there with Colin, I think um, the big uh, question about this thing is, what is the real state of man after the fall? Uh, because if we really understand that, then, um, you know, I think one would understand why God saved monogistically. And so maybe let's just maybe define monogistic and synergistic so that people understand and and let's also just say we don't want to be bogged down into terms and stuff because you know we want to be biblical but you know throughout history names does come up and uh, people we, we give names to certain things which is just oh. i think god has created us to be creative and to make uh, names uh, like the trinity it's not a name that was in the bible originally it was a name given to uh, by the church as they came to understand what what the Bible reveal about God, so you know the term monogism is 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 um, it's just a, it's a term that was uh, uh, created by the way um, uh, uh, the, the the church fathers could see how God saved from Scripture, how they saw um, what God says about salvation in Scripture, which means God starts salvation. He's the, the he's, you know salvation is from the Lord alone, like Job says. Salvation belongs to the Lord alone. God is the only one that gives spiritual life. That's mm -hmm. why it's it's monogism is God alone. Synergism comes from the view that says, no, it's a co cooperation. It's a cooperation uh, uh, between God and man. So man is not completely dead in his sin. He's kind of half dead or there's some form of goodness or whatever left in man good enough so that everybody can by himself make um, a judgment whether the Bible is true or not, and whether one can by himself give give something or bring something to the table. In other words, when I read scripture, uh, synergism says it's I'm I'm able to see that Jesus is Lord. I can I, I have some sense of my own sinfulness and therefore okay. I can take that first step. And they call it sometimes prevenient grace. It's like everybody has a little bit of grace uh, received by God, and and therefore everyone can make that choice for yes or no, and it's up to you to make that final cho choice. And that's what synergism basically comes down to. While monogism says no, from Scripture we see that man is dead in his sins, like Ephesians two verse one to ten tells us. You are you are born dead in your sins. Paul clearly says there. I think even in um, some other passage he says. Um, we follow the ways of the world. Naturally, we are all, when we come into this world, we follow the ways of the world. And if you read Romans 3, there from verse 9 onwards, it says that there's no one good. There's no one. That, uh, Paul uses the word no one continuously there, um, emphasizing the fact that there's not a single person in this world that has this ability. And I think we must emphasize the word ability. You know, there's no one with this ability to understand God. Paul speaks about there about fearing God, understanding God, knowing God, or have any sense of righteousness or contribute any form of righteousness. And then he ends there, right in the end, and he says, there's no one good. And um, in, effect, in effect, he says, our feet, and he metaphorically uses it there, we are quick to shed blood, meaning that we are quick to sin. That's our natural state. Our natural state is inclined to sin. So if, if a choice comes before us between righteousness and sin, uh, even, if, even if there's a way we, we can see uh, some value, we will mostly incline when it comes to spiritual matters towards sin and self, selfishness and flesh and unrighteousness. We will not make a choice for Christ. We will not repent in our, out of our own strength. Um, you know, it can maybe you can give mental assent to some truths, some mental uh, choices, but that deep spiritual understanding from who Christ is and to really confess your sin, to really confess Christ as Lord, that that for that we need spiritual rebirth. I think Colin alluded to that from from John three, John, you know, when Nicodemus came to the Lord. I mean, Nicodemus could see something about Jesus. You know, some there was something special about Jesus, but he said. We know he's a prophet and he must be a good man because he must come from God. But Nicodemus could see Jesus' divinity. He couldn't really see that Jesus is the God man, the savior, and he couldn't really understand his own need. And the Lord pointed out pointed that out to him by saying, listen, you are a teacher of the law. I mean, you're supposed to know these things. And, and then he answered him and he said, but unless you are born again, 
you're not able to enter the kingdom or see the kingdom. Now, enter is repentance and, and see is revelation and understanding. You know, so both those two things is needed for salvation. And it's only possible by rebirth first. And that's why we talk about monogism. That's why we believe in a monogistic uh, salvation. That's rebirth first. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks. And I thought sort of maybe um, quite something from what Steve Lawson said. He said, um, and I, I'm going to ask you a question based on this. He said the following, there may be no truth in the Bible more deeply loved and greatly cherished than the subject of the new birth. I know you guys have, you know, spoken about, you know, John uh, 3, about Jesus um, speaking to uh, Nicodemus about uh, the new birth. And he said, and then he carries on and says, here is the grace centered message of a new beginning for those whose lives have been ruined by sin. Here is the life changing truth that sinful men can be made new. And I, what I want you guys to really speak about is um, the difference um, that someone that holds to a synergistic view of salvation has when it comes to the new birth, uh, regeneration, um, and in order, in a sense, the order of salvation so to speak. So you can maybe speak to that. Cause I think, again, this is often where, you know, if I just even look at my own upbringing, um, you know, and the churches that I uh, grew up in, uh, again, there was almost a call of salvation. Um, and the, the, the reality was that when um, the, the message of the gospel went out, I was really told that Matt, you need to make a decision for Christ. Uh, and then, you'll be born again. Mm. So can you maybe speak, speak, speak through this a bit? And again, why this thinking is also uh, quite anti-biblical. Can I go, Colin? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go. Um, <coughs> I think that, yeah, uh, I think from when people talk about, I make a decision for Christ, um, then really what happens is, is this idea of rebirth, of being born again and made new, is really just an afterthought or an after effect to um, something that, that you've done, to a decision that you've made. It's not um, at the center of your Christian identity. Uh, many people who view Christianity like that almost see God as a kind of bouncer, you know, outside of, of heaven. And so what they would accuse us, you know, who hold to reform traits of doing this is he's this, mean bouncer who only lets a select few people in, you know, and whereas they're saying, no, he, he will open the door and just let everyone else who wants to come in, come in, um, you know, and they miss a point that Yaku made like really well in the beginning there. And that's that we are dead in our sins, you know, rebirth. When you look at it monogistically um, or from a reformed or Calvinistic perspective, then becomes central to who you are as a Christian. I was a sinner. I was dead. I was worthless. I had brought nothing to the table in terms of salvation. And now I am made new. Uh, th this is something that I, I, I cherish greatly. I, I rejoice about it. I, I still to this day sometimes weep when I think about it. Be because God has made me new. He's given me new life. And, and only because of this, I am able to enjoy the wonders of worshiping him and, you know, opening up his word and delighting in scripture and singing together with other brothers and sisters of his glory. When you have a synergistic view, and again, I'm not saying everybody who, who is not reformed now doesn't enjoy those things. But when you have a synergistic view, the logical end to that idea is that rebirth is just an afterthought. Um, you know, there's no necessity for it. Matt, uh, let me also latch a bit on that idea of, of decision. You know, I think sometimes um, we are also, uh, or people misunderstand. Um, and, and I think they don't, they misunderstand what we're saying. And they also misunderstand if you think of the fall. So sometimes we judge humanity pre-fall where God has given man a free choice. And that choice, he was able to exercise that choice because he was in a spiritual, alive, and sinless state. But when man fell in sin, when humanity fell in sin, 
I mean, we must also remember God made a, the creation covenant. God made a, an agreement and says that you should fill the earth, you should obey me, and you should live for my glory. And if you don't and you disobey me, then you will die, surely die. And that obviously happened. But God didn't pull back that creation, that creation covenant and creation order. That order right. still stands. God expects of every person to obey him, whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, God expects of every person to obey him, to live for him, and to obey his commands. Now, that decree still stands. And so man was created in the position to fulfill that decree. But then the fall come in, came in between, and man, after the fall, is dead in his sin. So that, that decree still stands, and God will hold us all accountable to that decree. And that that. That, that decision to say, you must follow me, is still the calling to all of humanity. But now we've fallen into sin. And as the Bible clearly reveals to us, our wills, our will is just an instrument. I think sometimes people make the will more a personality. Uh, the will is just an instrument. My heart is the one that enables me to use my will, to exercise my will. But if my heart is in sin and my heart is dead, what will I use my will for? Am I able to use my will to obey God? So that's why, you know, guys like Luther wrote the, 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 you know, the slave, the, the, the famous book of him about the, 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 the will, the will being enslaved. And that man's will is not, is not really free because man's will is, is bound to his heart. So now after the fall, the choice, God calls us still to a choice. So we must make a choice and we must follow Christ, but we can't. And it's not we are we are and God is not unfair because the state we are in is not His mistake. He created us in His image. He created us sinless, and He gave us everything we need to obey Him. But humanity in Adam yeah. left that position of sinlessness to obey the deceiver, and that decision was ours, not God's. So we've dumped ourselves into uh, this dead state that we are in. So now that we are in that state, um, God still calls us, but God's gracious enough as well to, to, to then come and give grace. He could have just left us like we are, not even extend grace, but extended grace through the Lord Jesus Christ and his calling. But it was his choice to decide who he's going to give that life to. And so if we look at this fact that humanity is dead in their sin, and we don't believe, when we believe in a synergistic approach to salvation, we must ask ourselves, how are God then, how is it able to offer good news to even the hardest drug addict, you know, in the deepest sin? If that person, you can think for yourself, what power will bring that person out of that condition? So, and that's where I believe, you know, it is really just the true love and grace of God that can pull a person out of that dead condition. Uh, you know, R.C. Sproul give this picture that, to picture these two is, he says that for some people, uh, sinful humanity is like someone in a storm trying to stay afloat on in the ocean in a big storm, and you throw the life uh, uh, ring to him, and he can grab the life ring. Well, what we see in scripture is that humanity is actually on, the, on a sink to the bottom of the ocean, dead. In their sin, and God dives down and He gives life and He rescues you completely. And that's the picture that we see. And I think this sovereign grace is really the only answer for for really salvation. And I think it's an empowering, empowering thing to know that it's not in my hand. I don't have the I don't have to bring something to the table to convince someone to accept Christ or to believe in the gospel. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, just um, latching on to what you guys have said, I think often there are many straw men that are thrown out to uh, the person that holds to sovereign grace um, in the sense that, you know, we will be accused of uh, a number of things, in a, you know, when it comes to the will of man, that man is merely a robot and doesn't make actual choices. Uh, and Obviously, that, that is, is not true at all. We do not hold to that. Um, but as you, you both have alluded to, uh, the Bible is clear that man is dead in our sin and our trespass, and only a work of God uh, can bring life to a dead man. The, the, the soul that sins will die, and so we need God to ultimately rescue us. Um, you know, actually, this, uh, talking about sprawl, you know, a number of years ago, um, I heard him use an analogy, and I think it's, just, it's, it's so 
uh, simple to understand uh, regarding the will of man and the fallen will of man. And he used the example of a lion. Uh, you know, if you had to, you know, on, on one side uh, of a lion throw, you know, meat and dead carcasses and all, you know, all these, these, these things. And on the, on the left hand side, you had to throw, you know, fruits and vegetables. You know, what would the lion go for 10 times out of 10? You'd go you know, naturally to um, what he desires, and that would be the meat. Um, and, and so in a sense, man has a choice to do what is right. Uh, the, the problem, though, fundamentally, is that man's heart is inclined to do what is wrong and to, to, mm-hmm. do, to do what is evil. Um, you know, the Bible is very clear. Jeremiah, the, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Um, and I think that fundamental uh, you know, points often people miss. So again, we do not d- deny the will of man that we actually make choices. The problem is that when it comes to spiritual matters, uh, we will always uh, resist God. We will always run from God. Um, you know, maybe then if we can maybe chat around the fact that what, why do you think, you know, the doctrines of grace are, I would say, even detested by many, you know, professing Christians? Or what, why do you think, you know, people, um, you know, have almost a hatred when the word John Calvin comes up or, you know, Calvinism or, or you know, the doctrines of grace or cheat or again, maybe if you can speak to that as to why do you think many people, uh, uh, you know, in that they call themselves Christian would, uh, you know, hate this doctrine so much. Yeah, Matt, uh, I think there's a, obviously a couple of reasons. I think one is just, over the over the years, you know, um, I think there was bad debates, and let's call it that way, where people really just slandered each other and on both sides. I mean, I think there's sometimes uh, Christians who don't know these things so well and uh, just simple in their faith, and they hear about these things, and initially you are shocked when you hear it because let's be honest, it's it's it's, it's a hard doctrine. I mean, I think many of us has has battled with it, and then when you do show some resistance. Um, people might then hurt some people and then some antagonism has grown over the years, I think. So they, they, this, you know, people are really treated. Uh, I mean, we must be, we must be clear that the, 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 way, the catechisms, I think both the, the 1689 and the Westminster says that this is a doctrine that we need to be very careful with. And it's a doctrine that is more for discipleship. It's not something that we go and openly fight with unbelievers on the street with. And I think, I think even with young Christians, this is a doctrine that we need to be very careful and, and wise with, because it is, it, it's not, it's, I mean, uh, yeah, and let's be honest, it's, it, you know, it's not hard. So, yeah, I think the first reason is this doctrine was treated badly by, uh, you know, stagecoach Calvinists or whatever, um, and people who just talked hard about it. And then it, it, it brings antagonism. And I think there's people who's antagonistic towards it purely because of that. And secondly, let's be honest, Matt, you know, even in my, my, my own life, and um, when we were confronted with this, and, um, you know, when I was confronted, uh, although I think sometimes the way God saved different people, it, wasn't a, it was easier for me in a way. I mean, when I heard it the first time, I thought this must be true because I was such a wretched sinner. I, I realized I was just so, and I was so under the condemnation and judgment and realized my sin. That, and, and I saw this God glorifying approach towards salvation. It, it was just something that I realized this must be the truth because if you look at some other things, it it, it sometimes feels it's, it's a bit, go, you know, a bit, bit man-centered. And I don't want to say that, that everybody is like that. I want to speak carefully and uh, not do what I already warned about in the beginning. So I, I think, and then sometimes our hearts, Matt, Matt, our flesh, our pride does stand up. You know, it's difficult to handle. It's difficult to, when you're confronted, when you're a father or a mother, you're confronted with the fact that there is such a thing and then you should, no, it can't be. It can't be because that, that would may put my children at danger or, or your family members or something like that, you know. Um, so I think that this, 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 this thing that God, the way God is, has designed salvation puts God in the center and it, it takes us out of the center. And it's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's not the easy thing. Uh, you know, we must take up our cross and follow Christ. And that's a hard thing. So those are the two things I would say um, cause, cause uh, reactions in people's hearts. I can't yeah. know if you want to add anything. Um, yeah. Or um, I think Yaku hit the nail on the head there. Um, there are times where, you know, Christians, Calvinists, 
or reform people, whatever you want to call them, have behaved and responded poorly. He made mention of cage stage Calvinism, you know, that I'm out of the cage stage. Um, I can look back at it with irony because this is the doctrine where we're saying God and God alone mm. own, is the only one who can open your eyes to these truths. And then we go to people and shout at them and say, why don't you believe this? Um, you know, and there's, there's a bit of an, an irony there. But um, I think, yeah, Yaku touched on as well, as, um, you know, our own hearts. And I think, and I, and I say this with respect, I, I don't want to, to now try and um, badmouth, you know, any of my brothers and sisters who hold to, to different positions. But I, I think there is a small sense of pride sometimes that creeps in with this. There, there's this sense of accomplishment we have um, when we become Christians. I think especially in, in these very Christianized societies that we live in, where there, there's still somewhat of, um, how can I say, like cultural benefit to being a Christian. So, um, you know, in these kinds of settings, you know, many people will come into the church. So I think there's a large number of people in the church who are just not born again. Um, and I think that doctrine like this will especially um, grate hard against their unregenerate hearts. Now, I'm not saying everyone who isn't reformed is, is not a believer, but I think there is a large proportion of people who are not regenerate who then turn and hate this doctrine because of that. Um, and I think the other part, you know, it's we feel a sense of accomplishment sometimes with our Christianity. Even me who holds to these doctrines, I find myself in that camp. I find myself patting myself on the back going, you know, well done, Colin, look what a good Christian you've been. And, mm. and that's fine. You know, that's things we need to rid ourselves of. Um, and, you know, a way to almost to mask over that is, is to almost give yourself that sense of accomplishment instead of rid yourself of it. I um, mean, so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm yucking a bit here because I don't want to say anything that's, that is going to be too offensive. But I, I think that if we do hate this and, and we're trying to say, I do add something to my salvation, um, I think we really do need to question our hearts. Then. We really do need to ask, like, like, why am I holding so hard onto this? You know, is it because I want to have contributed something to my salvation? You know, and then I think there's some serious questions that we need to ask you know, about what we think the work of Christ accomplished on the cross. No, th thanks, guys. Um, yeah, and, and I think there's, a, there's, there's truth on both sides. So um, I, I do know that there, there are uh, reform folk um, that yeah, are pretty hostile uh, and maybe not gracious, which I think is quite ironic, as we, you've mentioned, uh, in terms of what we hold to, in terms of that, you know, if it wasn't by the grace of God, where would we be? Um, but on the other side, yeah, I do think, um, and again, in a respectful manner, I, I do. I would say that um, many ho hold to a synergistic view of salvation because at the end of the day, they almost above everything uh, want their own choice, their own will uh, to be um, emphasized. Uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, God's not going to force me to do anything. I, I, I chose to be a Christian. I chose to follow Jesus. Um, and if I, and again, I think this is where, you know, if we think about um, uh, perseverance of the saints, often many in that camp would say, no, well, that's also a doctrine I, I could never hold to because the, the fact is uh, I can let go of God's hand. You know, I can at the end of the day say, well, you know, I'm no longer a Christian. I can walk away from God. Um, so I think, again, we, you know, people do need to be really careful um, uh, when it comes to, you know, because this is foundational, you know, to our salvation, what, what we actually believe about God, what we believe about God's redemptive purpose uh, throughout history um, uh, really <laughs> is essential uh, to the Christian faith. So it is something that people really need to think through. And I think, you know, in, uh, on, on the other side, as we, we, we do know that, you know, many, I think over the last, you know, 30, 20, 30 years, uh, many, even young people, you know, 
um, have really been drawn to reform theology because they've, they've been tired of man-centered um, doctrine, you know, uh, this uh, very, you know, gospel light type of teaching. Uh, people have been hungry for truth. People have been hungry for expository preaching. Um, uh, and uh, so I think that's why many, I think even young folk um, have really, uh, I think, uh, really been drawn to to Calvinism, uh, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, and, and if, if anyone's watching, I think there's a really good uh, movie out there called Calvinism. Uh, I can recommend, you know, if you also have, don't have a good understanding of, you know, who is John Calvin? You know, he, he's, he's quite a hated man, <laughs> you know, by many. And I think for for, for not good reason. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good good documentary. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. If you, if you want to maybe dig deeper as to, you know, what it means when someone says, well, I am... Calvinistic. Um, so maybe just moving on, when, when we think about evangelism um, and we think about those that would say they are, you know, uh, a Calvinist, would you not say that is an oxymoron? Again, you guys have said that, you know, at the end of the day, God unconditionally saves his elect people. Uh, you know, he set his affection from before the foundation of the world. Uh, so again, do you think it's an oxymoron when we, we think about a Calvinist evangelist or, or someone that says, you know, I'm going to go witness to the lost and has a passion for the lost. You know, ma many that maybe hold to an Arminian view of salvation and say, what are you guys doing? You know, God, God saves, you say. So why would you evangelize? Yeah, well, Matt, I think, uh, you know, it all depends on, again, coming back to what we said right in the beginning, your view of, of fallen humanity and in what state it is. But, you know, I just want to read in that sense one verse that I looked up here, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. So I think let's just listen, listen very carefully. It says here, the God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers. Okay, so that, that's the state of unbelieving humanity. God has blinded the mind of unbelievers. Now listen, oh, not God, sorry. Satan has blinded, um, the God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. So this is the reality. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. So, I mean, it's clear from this verse that this is the state a person is in. He cannot see. He's blind. He's dead. He cannot see. So what are you going to do for him and how what is he going to do for himself if this is the state who is a person is in so coming back to your question about evangelist calvinist evangelist or someone who believes in this in in, in monogistic approach uh, from scripture about rebirth i mean if i read this verse it tells me that is what it must be that's how it should be and so i mean we also know that scripture tells us that uh, according to Romans, that no one, um, uh, you know, faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. And in, in the same passage, it says that people don't believe because um, uh, we, we need to proclaim, because they haven't, they have not heard, and we need to proclaim the word. And, and I mean, in, I think it's in another passage, Paul, uh, Timothy says in 2, 2 Timothy 2 verse 10, he says, therefore I endure, dear, dear everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So we, in, we endure everything by meaning we're preaching the word for the sake of those that Christ wants to say, save and want to draw, the Father wants to draw to the Son. And so if it's true that humanity find themselves in this state where they are completely dead, um, my approach towards salvation is purely this, that I trust Christ to, to know who he wants to save, to who he, he wants to regenerate, and my role is to be that ambassador, to be that instrument and that vehicle. It's not my role to worry about who will be regenerated today. It's not my, my place. I'm, I'm serving Christ. And also, you know, when we started uh, outreach, uh, Goodwood Outreach, we talked often about this. And that is that um, we, we're going to the streets to proclaim the gospel first and foremost to glorify God. Because when he's, his son's name is proclaimed on the street. The Father is glorified. So sometimes people have this approach that if somebody is not saved, our salvation efforts is useless. It is failed. No, that's not that's not true. So why when is our, self, our our efforts successful? When we proclaim Christ, we are obedient to the Father. The Father is glorified, and we are successful. 
And not because we are successful or because we are doing it, because we do what the Father is saying. So I think that that's the different approach it brings to you when you evangelize, when you have a scriptural view of salvation and how rebirth does happen. Colin, I'm not sure if we lost Matt. Maybe um, we should I'm continue there. Are I'm you there? Because your picture is still in our side. I'm, I'm hiding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Colin. Just to, to add to that, um, you know, another thing, you know, people may think, uh, and a Calvinistic evangelist is an oxymoron. But if we ask the question, why do we evangelize? Almost anybody would say, because in the Great Commission, Christ has commanded us to. And if we look at that commission, you know, it's very interesting how that's formulated. Christ didn't say, go and convince as many people as you can to believe in me. You know, he started with a statement, a statement that said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. But the reason we go and make disciples is because Christ has all authority. Now, if Christ doesn't have authority to save, if he doesn't have authority in salvation, why must we go because he has authority? You know, it makes no sense. Uh, the only way that commission makes sense is, is with a God and with the Christ and with the Savior who has the authority to save those who he's sending his people out to proclaim the gospel to. You know, and, I, and I really think we see this echoed throughout the New Testament as well. Um, you know, Paul talks about it. He says, Yaku mentioned, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Later in Romans 10, Paul says, um, you know, how can they hear? Where's that verse? I have it somewhere here. But, yeah. Someone that said, how, how can they call on him who have they, they have not believed? And how are they to believe of him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And so we go out and we preach good news. Because all authority has been given to Christ and he saves. Um, you, you know, so you could almost turn that around and, and say, how can someone with a synergistic view you go out? Like, like, what are they doing? Are they proclaiming the gospel? Or is it just merely um, trying to convince people? You know, and that, and that brings me just to a second point. And, and you guys will know this well as well. The most common objection I hear when people say I can't go evangelize is that I'm not good at arguing. I'm not good at debating. Um, I don't know how I would convince a complete stranger of these things. Um, the beauty of the gospel is that we don't have to. All authority is given to Christ. We just proclaim the good news. He will save all who are his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. They know him. They will come to him. Um, I, this is a great encouragement for all you guys to get out on the streets. God saves. All we need to do is proclaim the gospel. It's beautiful. You know, you, this reminds me. I'm gonna actually. There's two questions which I'm gonna get to now, guys. Um, th thanks for sending those through. Um, but just as you you mentioned that, you know, that uh, the sheep will hear Christ's name, the shepherd's uh, voice. Uh, so rather, you know, Joel Beakey uh, uses this illustration. He said, you know, he was in Scotland. Um, he was uh, preaching at a church and. He went back uh, to the pastor's home and, and he was basically chatting to the pastor about, you know, he had heard that, you know, that um, uh, in, you know, if you, in the field, um, you know, sheep that have different, that will have basically different color uh, patches on their, um, uh, on their back. And when uh, the shepherd calls, makes a, you know, a, a sound for his sheep, only those that have the marking of his sheep will lift their head and go to the shepherd. It, it's actually, I actually Googled it the other day and actually just I saw this, you know, farmers actually doing this, uh, shepherds calling their sheep and they will only listen to the shepherd's voice. And it's just so beautiful to know that, you know, those that have been called will hear the Lord, Lord, the Lord Jesus um, and they will come. Um, so just, you're getting so few questions. Uh, good evening, Conrad. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, the, the guy, so uh, Conrad's question is the following. Many people claim to be true Christians, even when praying a sinner's prayer uh, and believe in salvation by confessing Jesus as Savior. 
they seem to be on fire for God for a few years, um, but later on fall away or uh, from God. So how do you really know you're a true Christian? What's the things to look for to know you have true salvation? Yeah, well, Matt, I think um, the first thing that is the Bible is clear that those who really belong to Christ, who are really born again, they will bear fruit. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. <clears throat> and Galatians 5 give us a clear picture of the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. So, um, uh, you know, someone who bears the fruit of the spirit um, uh, and part of the fruit of the spirit is perseverance, to be persevering until the end. So if your heart was really changed and the Holy Spirit lives in you, the Bible is very clear, you will persevere. And the same grace that brought you to Christ is the same grace that will take you home. Um, and that is the only true mark of a real Christian, is someone who persevere. Someone who falls away, like one John says, has never been part of us. They, uh, like John said, they went away from us because they were never didn't belong to us or weren't part of us. So, uh, you know, that that's the reality. One, one reality I think sometimes we must understand here is, and I think Christians make this mistake with this question, is that, I think we want to be the inspectors of who's really Christians or not. And I said this with respect, not to be ugly, but I do think we need to, uh, um, we need to make a, a, some kind of a judgment, for example, when it comes to measure, uh, membership and stuff like that. But it's not us that will truly decide who is some, who someone is a real Christian or not. Yes, we must look at their fruit. If people don't bear the fruit, we discipline them. If they don't show repentance through discipline and they got off to the second or the third time, we will cut them off through church discipline because they show by their unrepentant heart they're not true Christians. But we must remember that picture that Jesus um, gave to his disciples. You know, when he told when a thief came and uh, the, the farmer sowed the seed and he planted the seed, which is a picture of the kingdom. And that, he gave that picture to us for this very thing. The farmer planted the seed, and, and, and that night when the farmer went to bed, the thief came and he sowed some, some uh, weeds among uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, you know, the good seed. And the next day, the farmer sees this bad, that bad seed came up with the good seed. And what was the, what was the disciples' response? They immediately want to jump in and pull out, you know, the bad seed and, and the weeds. And, and Jesus said, no, no, you don't do that because you will, you will hurt the, 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 the good seed. And he said, at the end of the days, when I come with my angels, I will, I, he will divide. So our duty is to preach the word, to apply what God has told us in the church to do. And that is to, for our church discipline, if somebody lives a life that doesn't claim his confession, we apply church discipline. Obviously, we will not jump in initially and start chasing people around and hurting people. You, 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 like that, that's why the Paul, Paul, Paul told Timothy, teaching, rebuking. Uh, um, there's a pattern there. You know, it's a, it's a, firstly, it's correcting, and then it's rebuking. And, and then you get to a point where you say, but this brother, we've spoken to you, or sister, we've spoken to you. You continue in this lifestyle. We don't show repentance. And But that will be a long journey. It's not something that just overnight you jump in and say, hey, you're not a Christian, we kick you out, <laughs> you know? So I think we must be very mindful of this. And I think sometimes as Christians, we battle with this, that the reality is as much as we want the church to be perfect and as much as we want to make sure that every person is really a Christian, uh, is that it's not in our hand that that final, that, that kind of a perfect judgment, because we will have to appoint ourselves as God to be able to make that perfect judgment. And it's in God's hands and Jesus gave us a picture. And we should just do what scripture tells us. If somebody doesn't bear the fruit of the spirit, we will correct and rebuke each other. And we will call each other to repentance and apply just church discipline we need it. Thanks, Jackie. Um, just another question from Darren. Maybe Colin, I'll, I'll put this to you. Uh, Darren says the following. Um, how do we evangelize and present the gospel to unbelievers since it is not by human choice to repent? And we've spoken a lot about this. Uh, the reality is, yes, ultimately... God is the one that elects. So he, he says, so how do we evangelize and present the gospel to unbelievers since it is not by human choice to repent, but by God's sovereign grace to draw people to repentance. So basically some practical application as to how do we actually then evangelize? How do we present the gospel to unbelievers? Do we use some uh, methodology? Do we, are there tricks in our arsenal that, um, that we use? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, Get to that now. I just just want to add one small thing on onto what Yaku said there, um, because this is also just something I've seen happen in the church as well. Um, 
I've had, you know, men that I've looked up to um, who've come under church discipline and are not treated as, as unbelievers. I've had many close Christians who've walked this walk with me and have now fallen away. And, and often it, it rattles your face. You then start questioning, how do I know if I am saved? Um, you know, and some people might say, well, don't doubt. You know, just don't have any of the doubts, which, which I think can be unhelpful because it's um, – then when you have them, you're like, oh, um, now I'm questioning even more. And the whole thing can spiral out of control. You know, sometimes another response might be, you know, you just know in your heart um, that you've been born again. Um, and I've had moments where I feel like that as well. But what I would really encourage you to do, if, if you have experienced something like this, is to look at the word of God. Um, the word of God tells us, that we are saved, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, hold fast to the promises of the word of God. Hold fast to the work of Christ. Continue in that. Um, you know, and as you continue and you persevere in that, you, you will then know again that you are truly saved. Um, and back to Darren's question, which, again, is a very good, helpful, and practical question. I would say that because God is sovereign, we don't have to rely on, on any methodologies. Now, there are helpful things that people can do. Um, you know, Ray Comfort does Way of the Master that is quite helpful, you know, in revealing people's sin and then, um, you know, sharing the gospel. I would say that the main thing that we should do when we present the gospel is to present the gospel biblically, to explain man's state of sinfulness, as the Bible does, to um, then explain to them what Christ has done in saving us and call them to repentance and faith in Christ. Uh, the gospel then becomes a proclamation. So it's, it's not something that we just, you know, try and convince people or ask people to do to get in a response X, Y, or Z. It is truth that we proclaim to them and we let the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit work in their hearts. Um, you know, and when we see them responding to that, we can then, um, continue down the road of, of asking them to, to read their Bible, to join a, a, um, to join a faithful church. You know, if it's in the early stages, I would also encourage you, um, you know, many people say don't, but I, I think that if somebody is responding, we should call them to that response. We should tell them to believe, to trust in Christ, um, to call out to God um, for a newness of heart. You know, we can still do all of those things. Um, because God does enable people to do that. But all we need to do is proclaim the truth of the gospel as presented in the scriptures. Thanks, Colin. Uh, another question from Sandy. I think I'll um, try and give it a bash, Sandy. Uh, thanks for the question. Hope you're well tonight. Um, Sandy asks, um, why does God still find fault? Or who can resist as well? And I think you know, this is really taken from Romans 9. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful passage. I love this passage in one sense, but I know it's a difficult passage for many. I think, you know, m many, uh, I think even pastors um, either skim over this chapter or, or just skip it totally. Uh, but, but the reality is, um, I think if we, if we look at um, Romans chapter 9, verse 20, uh, you, know, you know, Paul really emphatically answers this. He says, but who are you? And it's just amazing, you know, that's 2,000 years ago this was written. This is the same question that people ask today, but it's not fair. Why would God only save some? You know, that's not fair. And Paul, Paul knew that. And so we, we see what he says. He says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one is formed, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use. And I know that's a difficult, but a difficult verses to digest. Um, but I'll just say maybe a couple of things. So, so firstly, I think, you know, with what we've already, uh, you know, spoken through uh, this evening, um, looked at different scripture uh, on this topic, we need to realize um, that if God sends every single person to hell, he would be right. He would be just in doing so, in, in, in doing that. No man deserves salvation no man deserves uh, to be redeemed uh, no man deserves to be reconciled back to god uh, again just ask that ask the question to yourself have i sinned how many things have i done wrong against god 
go through the Ten Commandments tonight. Just consider God's moral standard and, 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 and basically be honest with yourself and say, well, you know, have, I, have I lived up to that? And I think all of us, all 7 billion people on the planet, every person that fell in Adam would answer, I have sinned. Uh, I have fallen woefully short of God's standard. So again, I think first and foremost, we have to uh, be real with ourselves and say, well, at the end of the day, no man deserves to be saved. If God is holy and we are not, and God uh, demands perfect righteousness, what man can stand? What man can actually open his mouth to God? No one. So I think, again, uh, man in our, in our state, really this deserves uh, to be at enmity with God for all eternity. God's wrath should burn against every single one of us. Yet the question actually should be asked, why would God save any of us? If I, if I look at my, myself and I, I think about who I am, I think about the, the depravity of my heart, of what I've done against God, what I've done against uh, my uh, fellow image bearers of God, my neighbors, uh, friends, family, uh, why would God save me? Uh, and that is actually the question we need to ask. Why would God save anyone? Uh, and I think in a sense, uh, when we actually really consider the, depra the depravity of man, and I think that's the problem with many even people in Christian circles, we don't understand the depravity of the heart. We don't understand how serious sin is against uh, this holy God. Again, go right, read Isaiah 6, an amazing chapter. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So when we understand those truths, we will realize that it is, it is amazing. It's amazing grace that God would save just one of us, you know, one human being. And, and, and the beauty, if you read Revelation 6, God has saved a great multitude from all nations, all tribes, all tongues. So we can really glorify God for his great mercy uh, in salvation. Um, just want to, uh, there's one other question that came through. Uh, I just want to get to, it's from a brother Tabang. Uh, thanks for the question, Tabang. He says the following, I think it's a good question. Uh, he said, I would like, to, I'd like for you to touch on the question of making an altar call after preaching. Do you reform, and we obviously, we've, I think we've spoken about that in, in previous programs in terms of altar calls, uh, how popular they are in our day and age, probably, you know, since the days of Charles Finney. Um, so the question is, do reform preachers reject it completely? Or is it something that we can review so that it does not give people who come forward a prayer of false hope? Anyone want to take that? Yeah, Matt, um, I think... <laughs> It's a good question and can be answered exactly from our topic tonight. If, if we really believe, the scripture does tell us that God does sovereignly rebirth and that nothing will resist his working. Um, uh, if that is true, we have to feel no, um, um, we, we don't have to feel any need or fear that we can stop that from happening. We cannot prevent it from happening. So whether we do an altar call or not, if God decides that he's going to rebirth somebody today in that Sunday, that Sunday morning in the sermon, he will, does, he will do it because it's monogistic. And he does it in that moment. Uh, he, doesn't do, he doesn't do it in the altar call. In fact, your response, if you do go forward, then you are reborn already. You know, I know this might be a challenge to some people because I know that the, 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 the response would be, but okay, then I'd have to do nothing to be safe. No, it's not true. We need, still need to repent, but my repentance is a fruit of my rebirth. It's, it's faith and repentance, all those things is fruit of the, the rebirth. So if we take that thought into consideration, I think the whole um, pressure of making sure we call people to the front is, is taken out of the, of the fact because if I preach some, I mean, if you preach, I mean, I've listened to some testimony, people will just repent during the sermon without even coming forward there where they sit because rebirth is being granted to them. So, um, yeah, I don't want to say we uh, should reject completely, but I, I, if, you, if you take that consideration, I think there's more dangers with the altar call and there's more good in a way. Um, so there's people who has been really been saved um, with the altar call. Because God's sovereign, um, but I think uh, it's unnecessary. Um, we should. Uh, it, it takes. It, it causes unnecessary coming forward. The whole situation of people standing there. There's a temptation of pride. There's a temptation of 
uh, pressure. You know, people feel pressure. I must go. There's so many re- more negatives for me personally. This is my personal view towards this thing that I think it's unnecessary. If I understand salvation monogistically, there's no need for it. I mean, uh, sometimes I've done in preaching. I don't do it often, but here and there, especially when I preached a sermon, which I know there's some, it was a hard call for repentance. I will at the end leave, say I'm going to leave in quiet time for prayer. Why do people have to come forward? They can sit and pray there. I've done that. Not, I will not do it um, by habit. I've done it a few times. I would rather recommend that than, than an altar call, for example, at most. Thanks, Matthew. I don't know if you want to add anything, Colin. Um, I'll just maybe, maybe say, um, just on what, what Yaki said, yeah, I think you know, there has been a lot of damage um, done uh, in the name of Christ. Um, and I think it's given many people, millions, a uh, false assurance. I think, you know, I spoke about this a couple of weeks back. Uh, if you look at the numbers, um, the, the stats uh, even... Uh, you know, I think in the U.S., but across the world, um, the majority of people, and I'd say the vast, vast majority of people that make decisions, so to speak, for Christ, uh, are doing an altar call, a crusade of some sort, uh, often are nowhere. You know, they, they fall away. Uh, so, uh, but again, uh, as Yaku said, uh, there are uh, people that have been truly saved, um, you know, not because they went forward, but because the Holy Spirit granted them. Uh, they actually were born place. again before they went forward. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, I hope that I hope that answers uh, that. Uh, Colin, I don't know if you want to maybe mention anything. Um, not um, much. Yeah. Um, I, I was just going to mention that. Um, yeah, some people who have responded to an altar call have been born again. I think yeah. it was. Um, you know, we would have all been born again five or six times each. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, I, I went forward to the Billy Graham crusade. There were 10,000 people. Yeah. I was I was 20 years old. I was not I, saved. I was really only saved when I was 42 years old. Yeah, no, look, I've gone forward to those things when they've had them on like a Saturday morning. And, I, and I'm still... Oh, I shouldn't be saying this because my mom's probably watching, but <laughs> I was still a little bit drunk from the night before going out somewhere. And then I get to an event and people You're are You're guilty because your mom is there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and I'm like responding because like, you know, I've been compelled to almost by the mm. emotions. And that's a, like, I would just add, I think there's nothing wrong with standing from the pulpit and calling mm. people to repentance. And I think no, it, I agree would say we can make that call from the altar so to speak we can tell people repent mm. but i think the whole idea of making everybody get up and come forward in like this big grand mm. gesture mm. is is unnecessary you know peter okay. when he called people to repentance and act you know they cried out they were cut to mm. the heart. what do we do to be saved he didn't say well all line up and come forward now he said repent and be saved mm. Mm end of it then he went and baptized them and mm. so i would say that if you want to make calls for repentance from the pulpit i think that's fine but yeah. not I, I mean Colin, i also want to maybe add something to that just for parents that might be watching because you know i've spoken to many you know um over the years regarding evangelism uh, when it comes to children specifically and i think we uh, and I've, I've seen this personally and i've, I've actually it's it's almost worried me and concern me a great deal. I know I know these people have done it with um, uh, the probably best intent. Um, however, we know that you know we, we just think about adults and, and and this discussion around altar calls and the pressure and the the emotional harp around it, and you know people get up, get up and go forward. Now, when it comes to children, we even need to be that more sensitive. Um, it is very very easy to have a, you know you teaching Sunday school on a Sunday morning. Uh, and um, to get 15 kids, grade four kids or grade three kids to say a sinner's prayer of sorts uh, or to lead them to Christ. Uh, or even again, um, as parents, you know, we, we, we desire our children to be saved. So we just need to be you know, careful about, about that. So in the same sense, we preach the gospel to, you know, children. We, um, you know, we, I think as much as we can, we, we explain the gospel, we explain sin, uh, we, we disciple, the, disciple them. We go through scripture with them. Uh, but we just need to be very careful. Uh, and again, that's also a lot of wisdom that, that uh, needs to be uh, used because the reality is there are 
children that are young that come to Christ. Uh, the Lord does save uh, uh, children. Uh, that, that's the reality, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, yet we just must be careful in terms of um, uh, you know, pushing it too far where we are prompting children too much uh, because we want to see a result. So I'll leave it there. Um, you know, uh, Yaku, Colin, uh, thanks for uh, tonight. Is there any, any maybe closing thoughts or anything you want to share with, um, uh, with the audience tonight? Matt, I, I think I just want to close with that, that one of those questions is, is a last comment. It was asked, how do we preach the gospel? And, and by saying that, you know, um, uh, understanding how God says and see what the scripture says about that has really given me freedom, absolute freedom. I actually feel more empowered to preach the gospel everywhere where I go. Uh, I'm delivered from trying to put something up or put some, some, some good message together to try and convince people. Um, it has given me the, the confidence that it's not in my hand. The greatest drug addict I speak to, I can speak to him with confidence, with boldness, with the word of God, because the Bible says all authority has been given to Christ and scripture is alive and active. It's not, it's not in me because I, I really, I mean, just imagine yourself trying to, uh, save this person it, it feels like an impossible uh, task and just it frees you and it just and, and if you also take that approach where the bible just shows us to 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 preach the gospel is, is is an act of worship it brings glory to god it really is empowering it it, it takes all the all the shine of you as well it it, it makes you a servant it, it makes you a servant of christ it makes you one who sacrifices for christ's sake doesn't matter when people are really saved or not when you preach the word it's it's empowering so uh, i would close by that thought and saying people i would encourage people to to think of this and let this be something that empowers you to preach the gospel um, more and more um, and i think in our day and age time we this is something that we really need to start doing we need to take the gospel to the streets of our cities and this thing empowers us this this teaching empowers us this truth from scripture and I would leave people with that thought and challenge Christians with that challenge uh, that we need to start preaching the gospel and, 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 and go to our streets and our neighborhoods with the word of God. I'd just like to, to leave a closing thought, um, particularly for those who are Calvinists. Um, I know that there are quite a few on this, this thread watching it now, maybe watching it not live, but um, you know, this question of Calvinism and evangelism or Calvinism and missions often gets raised. And what I have seen is almost every Calvinist or reformed person I know has the ability to wax lyrical about why it's compatible and why it works and, uh, you know, why Calvinists are good missionaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then half of them go back home go inside and don't go out and share the gospel. Um, and I think that is a heartbreaking thing. Um, don't be a reformed person who, who only witnesses with their mouth. If you truly believe this doctrine enables us to proclaim the gospel, I would really encourage you to get out on the streets, go and share the gospel, proclaim the word of God every opportunity you have. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to close with uh, Matthew 28, uh, Jesus' words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. So thanks, guys, once again for uh, joining us tonight. Um, yeah, we pray the Lord uh, we with you, and I pray that you uh, got something out of tonight. Uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, go to our Facebook page. You can leave a comment there. Um, please also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Really, would appreciate it if you do, do that for us. Um, and uh, yeah, like our content, sh share our content. Uh, we really uh, do this uh, really for uh, your. Uh, uh, the edification of yourself so um uh, please do uh, uh continue to uh, support this uh, this ministry uh, and yeah lord willing we'll see you next week same time same place god bless <laughs>